Minnesota Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw, and that would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And this man has trained most of the great stars and movie stars of today. One of the best workers in the business, one of the best guys in the business, my dear friend, and also, by the way, unequivocally, the worst driver in the history of the automobile, Dr. Tom Pritchard. Welcome well, to the John, show, Dr. Tom. Well, I, I really do appreciate being on here. As we were talking earlier, I think I had a few things to clear up, and we might get into them later on. But uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I've seen bits and pieces of your guy's show, and, and I just want to know if Mr. Briscoe's drinking yet or not. <laughs> you can't tell <laughs> and, well, there you go that's my question i have that too but yeah good good to be with you guys man hey tom man it's a pleasure having you on here man you know we're joined by another texan just seems like uh john favors the texans on here more than anything else every time i bring up an oak he said no he he, he can't come on so well which which guy from Oklahoma would you be bringing up that he would he would object to is my question. Cowboy Bell Watch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, I think uh, I think Cowboy Bill Watts was really misunderstood throughout his time in the business, man. For a lot of things, even when he when he owned his territory, I think it was really misunderstood. I think John and him would have gone along great. <laughs> well he liked big guys i might have i don't know i think i'd have been fine quite a bit but uh, he liked big guys he yeah he liked big guys he liked guys like murdoch and, and dusty and stuff like that too so i think he kind of fit in that category as well you know but but yeah i thought about this later on especially as i got in in the, in the business and, and moved along i was such an idiot i mean i'm still an idiot but i was a complete moron but as I looked around and saw what Bill Watts was doing, he was doing like all the great bookers and promoters and stars of that day. They knew the lifeblood of the business was, was talent and young people, and young guys. And he would give anybody, if he saw some potential, he would go to that guy and talk to him. And he would put him in that spot to see if he could swim or, or, or sink. And uh, Bill Watts is a guy that came to me and said, have you ever thought about being a heel? And I said, every day. And he goes, yeah, I can see that. So I had a lot of stuff just trolling in my head but bill watts gave me an opportunity and i saw him give other people opportunities especially looking back man he he wasn't that bad of a guy he just wanted you to do your job get up be on time and 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 go out and do an hour if you wanted to do an hour so uh he tells the story i remember hearing him telling the story about dibiase and orndorff what he wanted them to go an hour of broadway and they complained and bitch and then bill says all right you pussies Go as long as you can and finish if you want to finish early. So that kind of fired them up, and they were going to be determined now. They're going to do the hour. So I thought, uh, looking back on things, and after talking to him a couple times in the last, gosh, five years, uh, he, he wasn't that bad of a guy. I think you guys would have had a lot of fun. You know, I really enjoyed being around Bill. And I, I, I honestly, I learned a lot from Bill Watts. And my brother's actually the one that talked Bill Watts into getting into professional wrestling. Uh, it was at, at a YMCA there in, in Oklahoma City. Jack was at the, at the Y working out. And Bill come in, he just got cut by the Vikings. And, of course, he came over to Jack. And Jack, uh, he, uh, Jack asked him what he going to do. Bill said, I don't have a clue. You know, I got this degree from the University of Oklahoma, which is worthless. <laughs> <laughs> we Texans yeah. will agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something we'll all agree on there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Know, big, uh, University of Oklahoma, OU is worthless. <laughs> and Jack said, how about professional wrestling? And Bill said, uh, I asked him if, you know, if he had started, he said, that's what I'm doing. I'm just starting. And he said, so uh, uh, Bill, Bill, instead of going to Tulsa and starting with uh, with Leroy, he called Vern up there, and Vern, Vern got him into business up there. But that, that's how Bill Watts started. Bill, Bill, when he came to Florida, was what you you know you know. And our business, it's all about timing. Mm. And Bill came down here just as we were getting ready to turn Dusty Rhodes babyface and make him the American Dream. Bill played a huge role in, in, in developing the American dream, you know, and so uh, he did, he was like a sponge around Eddie Graham, and you've been around Eddie, Tom. Eddie was brilliant in our business, and he just took that philosophy to, to Louisiana, Oklahoma, 
and applied it. Uh, basically, his philosophy was Eddie Grant's philosophy, except Eddie didn't have the rules and regulations that Bill had. And that, right. that's kind of where Bill might have went a little overboard, but he just wanted you to be a professional. And that, that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've heard both sides, both the, the guys who were on top, we loved him, the guys who were on top, we didn't. But, you know, I think you're going to find that clash uh, no matter where you go. Really Tom, the biggest question is, who in the world thought you should be a baby face? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there, there was a, there was a time, you know, that, that um, I, I, I looked – uh, like a baby face. I acted like a baby face. And then, dude, I, I hooked up with Manny Fernandez and Chavo Guerrero, and, and it was all off. Oh, my so, God. That, yeah, that was that was where I learned the drinking and the thinking and the, and the stinking thinking and all that stuff, man. I've seen so, those little Dutch boy uh, pictures of you with the haircut, like the little paint, Dutch boy paint. Right. Brother Bruce, right. That, that other preacher guy. The, <laughs> you're, you're by far the most talented of the two, by the way. There's no the doubt. The most grounded? No, the most talented. Oh, talent. <laughs> right as we say he's talented, he froze up. <laughs> you don't have to get mad, Tom. <laughs> yeah, you tell him he's talented. He gets all hot and his internet goes out. <laughs> yeah. Most of work's the other way around. You get hot, you're not supposed to freeze. It's not about what you do. Oh, my God. Were our connection unstable? <laughs> yeah, you think? Again, it was. I just, I let out a perfect soliloquy and you guys didn't even hear it. Well, anyway. Well, Go ahead. No, we're talking about you being the most talented preacher right 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 well i tell people all the time at our school it's not, not what you do in the ring it's how you are outside the ring and somebody told me this a long time ago because uh i was with a, a different partner at one time in uh in memphis and my partner asked the booker he says what do you have to do to get a break and the guy looked at him in the eye and says first of all somebody has to like you and i thought Ding, 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 ding. I wasn't a very likable guy later on, man. I just had a lot of uh, unlikable traits going on with me right there. But but I tell people it's not about those traits for quite some time, too. What's, I, have, I, I have been this way. I've got a story I could ask you about, too, Jerry. I don't know if you remember or not. But but it, it's more what you do outside the ring that really counts. You have to know the stuff in the ring, no doubt about it. But if you're if you're not likable and nobody wants you around their locker room or wants you around the office or just wants you around period, you ain't going to be around. So I'm sitting in Knoxville right now. So, uh, but, but I tell you, as you know, man, that, that place up there where uh, my brother works, as you know, very well, Jerry, it, 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 there's no such thing. <laughs> there's no such thing as you're, you're in for life anywhere. So Anyway, oh, speaking of this, I want to ask you because they asked Bruce the question, your, bro your brother Bruce, on yeah. some star cast that he's on with Conrad, billionaire Connie, and Bischoff and those guys. And they asked him, said, Have you ever gotten a fight with your brother Tom? And Bruce paused for a minute. And he goes, Yes, several. And then right. he goes, I've never won one. And he said, quote, Tom is, excuse my language, a mean motherfucker. That's what your brother said about you. So how many times did you beat up the three-time Hall of Fame judo champion? <laughs> He's a karate champion. Five times. Karate judo champion. Five times. Oh, is it five times? I, we don't uh, know. Every, yeah. every week he gets in a new Hall of Fame. Right, right. And, and that's pretty much what I think happens to everybody as you get older. You, you change the story on down the line. I, I remember – see, man, I don't remember it the way he does. But, but then again, I've, I've probably done a little more than he's done. I ain't talking about in the business. I'm talking about in the cars and the bars and the, all those other places. Uh, but, but you know, I do remember one time we were wrestling in the room and I picked him up to give him a belly buster and he put his finger down. His finger went all the way over, you know, backwards and I, he screamed and I went, oh my God, please don't tell her I did it. Because my mom was going to beat us with a, a rake or a kitchen uh, or a, a hanger, whatever she had in her hand, she'd throw it at us or beat us with it. So I don't know if I really beat him up as much as he said, and I think it just may be a, fig, may be a figment of his imagination too. But I, I did a couple times. I think I, I might have uh, tried to look like I was about to beat him up. Well, does that mean that you're in like seven or eight Karate Hall of Fames? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> in fact, I, I don't – I think uh, I think I might get in the uh, – the Ringgold Georgia Hall. My <laughs> oh God, there you go. My Bible's in it too. So I might have that going for me.
Tom, Tom, on, on, on a serious note here, now you 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 were a member of a military family, right? Now there's what five brothers in, in your family? Yeah, Bruce and me, and then we had three older brothers, and uh, so I'm the second to youngest. Bruce is Bruce is the baby. So yeah, yeah, my dad was a yeah, my dad was a uh, he was an army guy, and, and I remember growing up, man. It was he had this ring, the the, the army ring he used to wear, or, or his college ring, whatever it was i just know when he turned it around he, he we were going to get a slap <laughs> so so i was a little little i was i was aware of that but um you know and we yeah we grew up in the military family my brother told me not too long ago he asked me he says why in the hell do you think i went right into the army as soon as i graduated the next day why do you think i enlisted then i didn't want to be at home that's what he was telling us and i thought i once they left and, and Bruce and me were the only ones around, I figured it out, you know, but, but back in those days, it was a, a different culture. People were raised differently, thought differently. Their, their, their mindset was a lot different. And, uh, you know, so I think there's an old Lou Holtz quote that says athletes of today versus athletes of yesterday, you know, the athletes of yesterday cared about commitment and dedication and team and now today's are looking at entitlement and what are you going to give us and what do we deserve and all this stuff you know so different different mindset and that's that's kind of what we grew up with so so el paso uh, take us to el paso that where you first uh, you guys first started uh tuning in to the square circle stuff yeah yeah el paso man was in 19 i remember i was born in 59 so the early 60s i got to see the guys to on TV and bloody and guts and uh, some really good wrestling. I mean, some some actual. Uh, yeah, they were working, but man, they put their heart name, into it. Name wise, who do you recall? Uh, oh, the Funks. The, the Funks were the heroes in West got, Texas. Got the Funk TV and Romero's and all that down there. Yeah, Ricky Romero, the Funks, Gory Guerrero, Alex Perez, the Infernos, the Von Brauners, uh, Weingroff, and J.C. Dykes, and those guys that would throw fire, load the boot, tear their mask off, get blood and guts. And, and it was, uh, man, especially for a kid, we went, I think, three times to the Coliseum in El Paso. And uh, I went back there and worked when it was with WWE, and it hadn't changed. It was the same, <laughs> same, same Coliseum. It was the same crap hole that it was before. But yeah, seeing, you know, all three funks, uh, seeing the Romero, Ricky Romero anyway, um, Dick Murdoch, I remember Dusty coming to El Paso. I just, yeah, I grew up on Texas wrestling. I mean, the hard knockdown Texas wrestling. I got the best of both worlds because of 69. Hard, real hard. hard Oh, it was, man. But it was real. I mean, it was, you could see the sweat flying off. And and when somebody punched somebody, my, I'd look at my mom and she'd say, that's all fake. And I'm saying, but didn't you just see all that sweat fly in the blood? And she's trying to tell me this. My dad. Wrestling, too, from there was, was just awesome. I mean, you know, they had probably one camera to shoot it, but they, they, that one cameraman, he did, he never, and he wasn't smart to the business like a cameraman are today. But they were in the right spot at the, all the time at Seamoth. And that's what you know, made made that old school wrestling so unique, you know. Well, that that was it. And and you know, you talked about Eddie Graham earlier, and Dory Funk Sr. was a big uh ally and partner with Eddie Graham too. And I think they both had a hand in teaching everybody who came through the NWA at that time. And it was such a uh, I didn't know all that stuff. I didn't know how much power the funks we wielded back then, but you know, I certainly came to find out when Dory won the title, and then, then I got to watch Jack win the title in, in Houston, and I got to watch. Well, who was Jack supposed to win the title from? It and he, was, he was supposed to win it from Dory Funk Jr. And you know that That's was that right. was even back then. Powered out on it. That was cat. There was controversy even back then, and then when you finally hear the story as you go through the days, and Harley's no longer with us, but I remember talking to Harley on the phone in Stanford one time about getting these guys to work the extras as an extra, and and I had to ask him. I said, Harley, can you tell me the story about what what happened? What really happened? And he, he, he hemmed hard around until he says, well, I, you know, the old man wasn't going to let Junior lose to a baby face. Well, whoa. Okay. And then you think about it. And I thought about, my God, talk about the manipulation and the, 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 the truth and the lies. 
that were told to, you know, hey, man, I can't make it Friday night. It's Wednesday. What are we going to do? Well, I don't know, but I just you know, hurt my collarbone. I broke my collarbone. They got a big picture of it on the cover of the wrestling magazine. You know, he's hurt. He's got the cuts and all this stuff. And then, then I read Terry's. Any, uh, uh, hospital or reports or anything like that. <laughs> what? You're kidding. <laughs> there were no hospital reports. Hey, to bring the people up to date, here, here, here's what happened. Jack was scheduled in Houston, Texas to to, uh, to get the title from uh, Dory Funk Jr. They had gone around the country for for a couple of years and set these programs up, and they had dynamite hour broadways, 60-minute brawls everywhere that they went. But the Jack Jack's, Jack's role as a future champion, as you guys know, was to go to all these NWA territories and do a job for the guy, the number one guy in the territory. So when 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 you receive the title, that you could go and they had on film already this guy beating you. So it gave him instant hope that you know, hey, he beat him before with non-title. So you know he's gonna beat him again and become the champion. So Jack was scheduled uh, sometime in July, I think it was. No, it was actually March with Dory, and then he well, came back and beat. Yeah. 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 So yeah. We'll about that. Uh, Jack gets to Houston, and then all of a sudden, Paul comes and says, hey, uh, you know, Dory's been in a serious accident. He's not going to be able to make it tonight, you know. So I guess when he flew, what, Fritz down from Texas or something like that? You were there, right, Tom? You can take the story from there. I hope. <laughs> Tom froze on us again on his unstable network. <laughs> You know what it is? He's a Dory Funk fan. Hey, you know, hey, Jacob, you know, Tom um, Richard freezing up here. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. freezing up. I was looking at you guys freezing up too. But but the, the other little uh, caveat, I guess, on that one too is you know Houston filmed every Friday night unless hey. yeah un, un, unless the TV equipment was somehow unavailable. Here is July twentieth, nineteen seventy three, and. Biggest house, you got Jack Briscoe versus Harley Race for the title. They're going to switch the belt out. Big presentation. Sam Munchnick's there. I remember seeing Eddie Graham there and, and all these officials. And uh, there's no TV cameras. And looking back on that years later, um, it seemed to be like almost every other champion had that title change <laughs> filmed so they could bring it around. And somehow, damn luck, uh, Jack's didn't get filmed. So that's the only you know, switch in recent history and modern history that there's no footage of. And, uh, and you know, when WWE was going around buying the libraries out and buying the, the, the videos out of all these different territories for, for the, for the X network that they have now, uh, they still have it internationally, but, but I, I asked the guy, I said, when you go through that film in Houston, Go through those archives and see if you can find a, a real stump back in the corner somewhere that has Briscoe race on it. And they went through everything and they said they couldn't find nothing in there. Yeah, there were no no cameras set up at all that night. I remember because it was I remember a pretty... Paul were walking around. Oh, Paul had his own little handheld camera that he used to film that stuff. Now he well, no, he 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 would take still camera and still pictures, but they had that TV because Paul, I don't think, would know how to turn on a TV camera back then either. <laughs> But, but, you know, it was, it was so much, in my opinion, it was so much better back then because the guys were more authentic. They believed it. They were real. They took pride in what they did. And they stepped in the ring like champions if they were supposed to be the champion. And if you couldn't hang with them, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of preliminary matches just stunk to join out. When I talk about the old days, not everything was great back then, but there was a lot of great stuff. And the top guys were top guys for a reason back then. And going to a, to a different town, different city, seven nights a week sometimes, uh, and getting to be able to do that, that's all I wanted to do. I mean, I, I thought that was the greatest thing on earth. I still do if it was the way it was back then because you know how the car rides were and, and the, the arenas and some of those places, man. You'd walk in and you would see a Jack Briscoe, or you'd see a Terry Funk uh, standing in the corner, and they're working in the locker room and they're having fun in the locker room. And and somebody will say something, and and it'll just it'll be back and forth, back and forth. And now, I hate to go on a rant here, but I have to real quick. The guys are texting each other from across the room on their te on their phones. They're not talking. They're not talking about what they did last night or or anything else. Room. 
Huh? They're, they're in the same damn room and they're texting each other. Yes. Yes. Is that not the damnedest thing? But, you know, you and, and nobody was ribbing back then. Well, I mean, there were ribs back then. Nobody's ribbing today. I was going to say, nobody's ribbing today. So, so you need a Bradshaw to clean this crap up. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so that, that Tom, was, that I, was that way, Jerry, before you go, Tom, what was the reason that they didn't film uh, Jack Briscoe winning the top? <laughs> well, okay. Well, the official uh, reason yeah. was the television, the cameras were being used elsewhere because, you know, they had, to, look, they had more than two cameras at Channel 39. I'm sure. Here's your text, come on. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's Houston. It's the biggest match they've been building up for, man. It's the anticipation. You know, as a wrestling fan, I'm looking at this, and, you know, I, I know by this time in, in my life, it's, it's, it is what it is, but I still, that intrigued me even more. But the, the, the other excuse I heard was Dory Sr., uh, or I don't know this to be true, obviously, just passing along rumor and innuendo, Dory Funk Sr. made sure that there were no cameras there as far as filming it there was every all the magazines and international photographers at ringside it was full all four sides full of photographers if i remember correctly and uh you know i was i was taking pictures for the magazines back then too 12 and 13 years old for gong magazine in fact i still have the picture of jack they just put it in the new nwa uh title book about the old belt that the that harley dropped and then he exchanged for the new one um that, that uh, you know, they just wanted to make sure uh, that it was known that Jack didn't beat Dory. You know, that was the, uh, that was the thing. And then they didn't want Harley to be, be on film. Uh, that, that too, that, I believe. That, that group, like you said, Dory Funk Sr., he wielded so much uh, weight in the NWA. And then Bob Geigel was a part of that funk group there. And surprisingly, Eddie Eddie was the leader of it, but the Geigles and, and the Funks got together, John, and worked this conspiracy. I'm saying conspiracy because there's no proof except what my brother and I think. And the, the story, of course, Tom has regurgitated up that we 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 all heard a million times. But he's the only one in history that that there's not not a tape, at least a tape on some kind of tape on it. And there's not even, uh, you know, back then there was no, 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 no video cam or no right. camera cam that you could take. So there's actually no footage whatsoever. And in, in the history of the NWA wrestling, they're showing my brother who had the NWA right. championship. <laughs> right. So you know, and and the other thing is, God, they had such great matches, and they did this one thing all the time where Dory would take a hip toss. Uh, or, or Jack would give Dory a hip toss with the uh, left arm and come up in an arm bar or, or short arm scissors, stuff that you haven't seen then and you haven't seen it today. And those guys, Dory and Jack, just meshed together so well. They had that chemistry. And you knew when you watched matches like that, that was where the magic came in because they couldn't, it wasn't about remembering your moves. It was going out there and feeling the moves. And that's what those guys did, man. It's, 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 a, it's a lost art form today. Jerry, did uh, did your brother ever have heat with uh, Dory over that? Ever have resentment over that? Uh, the, you know, there was Dory and Jack got along fantastic, and, and they, I mean, like Tom said, they had such wonderful chemistry in the ring. But every, I mean, and and to this day, Dory still gets upset when when it, he's accused of. <laughs> of doing the right thing i mean right. it's, still, it's still a fighting issue if it, if, I, if i go in here right now and say somebody at dory funk's camp would get the message and give it to dory that and then misinterpret it so i'm not even gonna go there because we we, we went to worldwide with the funks and we made a, a truckload of damn money with them and and yeah. our, our, our matches whether single matches or tag team matches they just seem to jail and tell the story that the people wanted to hear. But uh, there, there was, there was some, always, John. There was always a little friction. You could just, you could just, you didn't have to hear it. You could just feel it. You feel could, it. Right, Tom? <laughs> yeah, I think you could feel it. And and once again, I thought that was when I first heard it. I thought that was amazing and incredible, because it was all business. And then I thought, wait a minute. That's how serious the business was back then, because if you had that that title, that belt, you were guaranteed to make what in the 70s 
over 100 or 200 a year. And that's a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. But but going everywhere you got to go, and and I couldn't imagine the the schedule uh, that Dory or Jack kept, or or Flair for that matter. But Flair's <laughs> Flair's an animal anyway. He's a different breed altogether. That's the reason I all goes back. I still think you know, with all this controversy, I still think Dory Funk Jr. is one of the most underrated performers ever in the history of our business. He kept that title for four years. And that John, they worked 360 days a year, not yeah. just locally, but all over the place. And Dory was one of these guys that wouldn't give you a 45 minute match. He'd give you a 59, 59 and a half minute match. Right. 59 and 59 seconds. I mean, he'd take it all the way to the limit. So you always got your money's worth and, and having the schedule they did and and Dory keeping it that long, and you know, and Dory's body holding up that long. Yeah, that's what happened to Jack. Jack just burned out, and his body burned out. He was ready. He was ready in two and a half years. Of, hey, take this thing. I don't want any more part of it. You know, yeah. Terry Funk, and he did that on purpose. He said, "Call Terry Funk to tell him I'll drop the title to him in Miami, my own territory." And right. That's what happened. So. Yeah, well, Dory, again, real quick, you know, when he did those uh, hour broadways, he had told me one time he would take uh, four 15-minute matches and just that's how he programmed it. He knew what he was going to do. And as, you know, the time was called out, he knew how to tell the story, knew how to build it. And it, it, it made sense. And uh, watching it as a kid, it was not a fast-paced match. They did high spots, but they told the story. And the reason – uh, they took their time was to sell and to make everything believable and take their time. It's not just five drop kicks, five super kicks, five punches, and we come right back up. And we do a high spot, and then we're all fresh and ready, and let's start again. So that's a that's that's a huge uh, a huge element that's missing today. And I don't want to get again. I don't mean to get on a rant, with, but but the folks. Yeah. Let's talk about Tom Pritchard down. Okay, you you'd seen you grew up watching some of the best wrestling in the world coming out of Houston, Texas. And I, it hurts me to say that, but Houston, Texas, <laughs> St. Louis, the best yeah. wrestling. Hey, I can do them this way too. So hold on, the just a second. Wrestling sir. in the world come out of those territories. <laughs> the best talent in the world was in those territories during those, oh, that stretch of the time. I don't care who you ask, it, it was it was great. So this is the, the the bug really started biting you. So you broke in while in Houston. Did you start working in Houston or actually how, actually how, uh, how did you end up with uh, with the label down? Take take us through that trip there. Well, okay. Well, actually, I I was uh, I got I was working in the office for Paul, you know, during the summers. Um, I got I got a job selling shoes for jc penny my older brother got it and i was two weeks in i was down at the uh, office talking to the ladies behind the counter telling them oh my god this is terrible you're you're, you're i'm selling shoes to old ladies and then i have to look at them go old ladies and they uh they took offense to that that was, that was one of my first earlier uh mistakes but as this is exactly how it happened too paul is walking out of his office and said those stories are going to give you a lifetime of telling he said uh, how would you like to work here and it was during the summertime i saw, thought like whoa what what how would you like to work here he had just moved into a new office bruce and i and some other guys helped him move from 2022 san jacinto at the corner of grade in 1919 caroline at the corner of pierce heard it my whole life so from there the iron sheet there was a guy who wanted to play foot or who played foot well, I think for the Oilers or somebody, but he wanted to get into wrestling because it's easy and it's easy money. So Gary Hart would come down every Friday morning, go in Paul's office, go to the matches. Well, this Friday morning, he came with the Iron Sheik, Cosgrove, Missouri. And the guy, the black guy was standing there and uh, Paul said, came to me and, and said, uh, you can take him over to the Coliseum. And if you want to get in there, you can. Well, a good wrestler always carries his gear and I'm 16 years old and I always carried some workout gear in my my, my car so we went down the coliseum and uh i'm thinking you know now i'm going to get to go in the dressing room going to dress where i see everybody you know on friday nights and that's the door you come out of we go in the dressing room locker room it's just a big room i'm going well this is uh not not as impressive as i thought but but i'm still getting to work with the iron sheet and i think you know, i think he's going to put on his pointed boots and his and his trunks with the camel on it 
No, he had some uh, some of those short wrestling shoes. I think you call them amateurs. And then he had his Olympic uh, uh, singlet that he wore and brought us out to the ring. And I'm thinking we're going to learn how to punch. We're going to learn how to kick. Oh my God. I'll never, I, I don't know what he had me to in this day, but he made us do a hundred squats, a hundred. <laughs> he got froze up talking about the sheik. He blew up. Man. <laughs> We're sorry. He blew up. <laughs> the sheik will do that to everybody. Easy. I did not say easy. He said, lock up like this. So we went to lock up again. And when I did, I slapped him. I think I'm freezing on you. No, you're yeah, you're good now. Okay. I slapped him across the ear, and he just put his head down like, I did not say. And he handled me, man, slapped the crap out of me. Uh, I'm trying not to cuss because we want to keep it family friendly. But he just knocked the hell out of me, man. My ear was ringing. And then he wanted me to get down first on all fours. And uh, or he was going to get on for all four first. He says, now you put me over, turn me over. And he's like 260. I'm a buck 40, buck 50, 16 years old, scrawny as hell. And uh, anyway, he turtled on me, wouldn't let me take him over. He goes, now I do you on my hands and knees. He took me over, put me on my stomach. To this day, I don't know what he did to me to be pulled back on my neck. He goes, have you had enough? I said, yes. He goes, scream, scream. Okay, okay, but no louder, louder. And I went, oh God, okay. And he pushed me off like a piece of garbage, stretched the other guy, went back to the office, and I'm hurting, but I ain't putting it over. And uh, the guy came, I think, one or maybe two more weeks, and he said, to hell with this. He didn't want any part of that either. So he actually started, I worked out a couple times in the ring with uh, the Sheik, Iron Sheik. And then Nick Kozak and Joe Mercer had a record service in Houston, and the ring was set up right next to a six-foot oil pit. King Parsons was training there, too. And a couple of the outlaw guys, who I knew nothing about outlaw guys back then. I didn't know who they were, where they came from, or anything like that. But they would come down and train with Nick, and we'd get in a, our, our sessions going. Bruce would come down and train, and Bruce would hang out sometimes. But they were running a show for Ernie Holmes. Nick and uh, Joe Mercer, they'd been training Ernie, and uh, they had a big show going on in uh, – Oh, uh, God. <laughs> Thank you. I can remember my first match. Anywhere, it was, it was somewhere up around Texas, uh, mid, middle of Texas. And I went, had my first match. And uh, the guy went in there and beat the living hell out of me and hit me with a chair and just went in there, didn't tell me anything. Uh, Joe put me over because he thought it would be great to put you over your first match. Yeah, I won my first match. Woohoo. Right. I've yet to win my first match, by the way. But. <laughs> <laughs> but except against Bruce, I guess. Uh, <laughs> according so, to Bruce, <laughs> according, to, according Bruce, to Bruce, it was a squash match. <laughs> well, I'll take that one too. But but once I got doing that, here's the other thing. Here here's where I all look back on my failures and my 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 uh, stupidity and not realizing how the business worked. I mean, I should have, but I was just so excited, man. I'm on the road now. Uh, but I started working TVs in Louisiana. Boyd Pierce would let me follow him from. Uh, Houston, we get done by 11 o'clock and start driving to Shreveport. And my first TV match, um, the matches are over, Boyd and I, I'd follow him, Boyd, in his car. We stop at a place called Lee's Den or Lee's Inn in Houston, Chinese food before we get on the road. Eat and start hauling ass. So about an hour into this drive, you know, we're on I-10, an hour into this drive, Boyd is in the left-hand lane, and I'm following him. And I see these lights coming up behind me really, really fast. So I put him up blinker and go to the right lane, and Boyd doesn't. Boyd stays, and this guy comes right up behind Boyd, gets almost on his tail like his bumper, and then he just moves over and goes to the uh, shoulder of the road and keeps going. And when he does that, like about literally – Five or ten seconds later, pretty pretty quick, he hits a guardrail of a bridge, and he goes hit, slides on the guardrail on the driver's side, and then goes over the bridge. This is no lie. They were in the commercial on KLOL, Houston's Rock, and 
of a sudden you hear Highway to Hell come on. And I went, oh my God, I'll never forget this. This is over 40 years ago. So that was that was the start of my, my road trips with Boyd in, in Louisiana, Arkansas. They were split up at that time. Oklahoma, just some shots around there. Up Wait a minute, what happened to the guy? Did he die? No, no, we didn't stop. Boyd stopped about uh, five miles up at a, at a uh, rest area. He says, see, that's why you don't want to speed, son. <laughs> we had to get the TV. We weren't going to stop. He wasn't going to stop. I thought, holy Christ. But that's what happens on the road. And we've seen a lot of stuff on the road. I've seen wrecks and fires and stuff like that, too. But at the end of December, I was supposed to start in Portland, Oregon, December uh, 1980. Started in October 20, 1979. Well, Gary Hart comes to me my last night in Houston. I was in a battle royal, and, and Jose Lothario, and everybody's looking at me like I'm just chopped liver, and I'm young, just fresh meat, and they're going to beat the hell out of me. They tried, they did, but you know, I wasn't gonna. They, that was gonna take a lot more than that to, to deter me. But Paul got me booked in Oregon, and Gary Hart comes to me the last day and says, uh, "You're going to start in Los Angeles on this date." I said, "But Gary, I'm going to going to Portland." He said, "Well, you'll go there for two weeks, and then you go to Portland." And I figured, well, they all had it worked out. They all knew what was going on because Gary's the booker and. Paul's the promoter, and uh, Don Owen knows what's going on. Michael Bell knows what's going on. I get to Los Angeles, and Chavo Guerrero is a booker. Whew. And right there, uh, I stayed for two weeks. I said, Chavo, when am I supposed to go to Portland? He goes, no, you're not. I called him. You're staying here. And L.A. was on its ass. I mean, it was a lot of fun. I'm 20 years old. I'm living in Van Nuys. It's Hollywood. And it's got any freak or geek you want to see or anything you want to do. And, you know, I was around, again, Chavo, Ron Starr, Johnny Mantel. And some of these guys that I learned later on might not have been the most uh, – wouldn't want someone to, to be a character reference in, in that way. You know what I mean? Like, who's your character reference? Johnny Mantel. Next. <laughs> you know what I mean? No dissing Johnny, but uh, come on, man. Uh, and Ron Starr was the same way. You know, I don't know if you guys know Johnny. Do you know John? John? Okay. I, I do know Johnny. Yeah, I tagged with him one time. I wrestled against him a lot in Dallas. Me too. I, I wrestled him as the, as the hood. But Johnny, Johnny again is one of those guys, again, no disrespect, but one, it, it was three nights in a row. And it started, I'll never forget where it started because it was in Fresno, California. And they would bend my left ear back and give me a stiff headlock give me a cauliflower ear because it, it got swollen up. Ron knew how to do it and Johnny knew how to do it. Went back in the locker room. They said, oh, come here, man. We got a razor blade. And they would slice my ear in Fresno the first night. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be a pussy. I'm not going to say, oh, no, I can't take it. The next night we did it, I think, in San Bernardino. They did it again. John and Ron both did it with a headlock and a head scissor. Just I guess messing with me, seeing if I was going to whine or cry about it. I didn't. They did. They lanced it again in the locker room. The third night, they did it again, and I went to the doctor the next day out, out in Watts or Compton, wherever the hell it was, and he says, no, nah, it's stuck like that. No problem, but the fact is, that wasn't going on back then, but they were being those guys and wanting to show you, yeah, this is going on. They, they, wanted, they wanted to rib a lot, and Johnny thought he was uh, – Thought he was the king of river suit. But you know, that, that's how I got to LA. I got I worked with Fujinami. I got a trip to Japan. So that that's why I really wasn't concerned about uh, making money right then. I was just wanting to have fun. I want to get some experience. Were the labels there at that time? Yes. Judo Gene and Mike. Territory yet? What's that? Had Piper left the territory yet? I met Roddy the first night I was in there. He was going to work with Andre. My first night in was in Fresno. And uh, Roddy came in yelling and screaming at this office guy. He says, you left me last night, man. And which, which I have something to say about that in a minute. You left me last night. I want my money. I want it now. I'm not going out. I want my money. And, and as he did that, he walked by and I was sitting in the chair. He goes, hi, Roddy Piper. How you doing? Hey, come back here, man. <laughs> so, so it was cool. And, I, and and he remembered that night. And I remember that night too very well. But one night, real, real quick, if I can intervene about, about this. We were somewhere up north when we were working in Atlanta. Tommy Rich and I were going to share. We were sharing a room. <laughs> I had a friend coming over. Talk about great influence. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. There's another one. But, <laughs> but we're great, great people there, Tom. How are you alive? 
<laughs> yeah, I've asked that many, many times. Every day I wake up, go, oh, no, another day. And then I say, I'm grateful, thank you. But but yeah, I was having a uh, uh, a guest over in Tommy. said, I'm going to go upstairs with Briscoe and Pop. So, okay, that's cool. My guest came and went. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know the room you guys were in. But uh, about three in the morning, I remember because I looked, I hear this pounding on my door, our door. Pounding, pounding, pounding. And I finally get up. I open the door and there's Tommy with his eyes swelled shut, sweat dripping down all. I mean, he's wet. He's nasty. And I, Roddy just throws him in my arms and said, wait, Roddy, what happened? He just keeps walking. God almighty. So he's got a busted lip, busted eye. So I put Tommy in his bed. And at about, I don't know, five in the morning, I hear him kind of struggle to get up. Goes in the bathroom. And he doesn't hit the toilet. He pisses all over the floor because I could hear it's going okay about eight o'clock in the morning there's a knock on my door I open the door there's Mr. Briscoe and he's got a got a swell up I do <laughs> and, I, and we go into Tommy and I remember Jerry kind of wakes up hey hey Tommy wakes up says, hey what 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 do you have to you <laughs> he said come here and he took Tommy into the bathroom. That's when we realized it was piss on the floor. And he looks in the mirror there and goes, well, what the hell happened? So, Jerry, from what I understand, you guys got a little rowdy. I think Tommy went to pour beer on you. I wasn't there, but this is a story I heard from any, and it was only the three of you guys. So I guess I could ask you, uh, what did happen that night? Well, uh, what happened if we had too much to drink? <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> And yeah, you damn amateur rapsters, you guys think you're tough. You can't get <laughs> an old fighter from Alabama or Tennessee. I could knock that. Out. Come on. So we uh, we're dumbasses. We we just started changing punches. Like that's the right thing to do, you know. <laughs> so yeah. we stood there, we changed punches, we tore out a door, the hotel room. I mean, Mr. Barnett called me the next day and I had to pay for a damn hotel door and all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what we're, well, we're doing is a, a change of punches. We weren't mad at each other or anything. We were just drunk. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I remember I thought you were drunk too one time when uh, we were going to work together. Well, it and is you about said, me now. Come on. Now listen, listen, hold on. No, no, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> yes, it is about you. <laughs> listen, it is. It is because you told me I worked with you one time. Can't remember the town. But, but you said, hey, Let's do something to fool the boys. You go behind or something like that. And I, you look like you're going to take me down. I'm going to block it or something. I'm looking at you like, there, nobody's going to buy this. Ain't nobody going to buy this shit that I can wrestle. I mean, I get that. But but we did that, too. And then then the funny thing about it, to wrap this up in a bow, was I was a shooting champion in Oregon. Came there as Kurt Henning was leaving to go to WWE. He was a shooting champion. You guys heard about the shooting champions in Oregon with, with Elton Owen? Oh, yeah. Tell us, tell us that in the five bucks or 10 bucks, whatever that was. Who, 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 well, how, how the hell did Orton, uh, Elton, not, yeah, not well, Elton liked to see guys shoot. Damn Mayor Kane. <laughs> I'm telling you, as a mayor of Knoxville in the county, the whole problem is internet's not working at Tom's house. <laughs> <laughs> He had such great in, he had such great influences as he was uh, breaking in. You, Tommy Rich, Chavo, Johnny Mantel. Johnny Mantel, I mean, they go down and down the list. Come on, John, come out of that. Now, now we're really messed up. All right, there you oh, There he is. Okay. Don't, push, don't push any buttons there. No, I didn't push nothing yet. Okay, but but Elton Owen liked to like to see these tough guys shoot so the guys you know one guy would get 20 bucks the other guy would get 10 or 15 and the guys would come back and they split it and un unbeknownst to elton you know he first time first thing he'd say to a new guy in the territory is how you doing kid can you shoot and they say already smart me up said yeah tell him you're a shooter tell him you're amateur wrestler i thought he's gonna know man he's gonna know there's no way i can i mean so Anyway, but Elton, uh, I, I, they always put me over a guy named Scott Ferris, who was like, again, 260 pounds, 6'5", <laughs> an amateur wrestler, 
from up in the northwest and he says no man you got it you got to go over in this shoot man just just keep spinning on me because he hates my guts and if he if he thinks it's work then he ain't gonna get any more money so well, i was a shooting champion for a while <laughs> next yeah. thing you know you'll be in a karate hall of fame <laughs> uh, you know what i, I don't think that that uh bus has already left the horse <laughs> has already left the barn so i'm good with where i'm at tom one time it, it, the, the tour you were on in germany uh with us wwe and I wake up and I've got a, a busted eye and a, and a nose I could tell swollen. And I thought, oh, no, I must have gotten a fight last night. I go, this is embarrassing. So I go get on a bus. I'm just kind of sheepish. I sit down and I sat, used to just sit right across from Mr. Briscoe. And yeah. as, as he sits down, he's got a busted eye and a swollen nose. <laughs> and then he starts coming back to me. He and I were wrestling the night before in a parking lot in Germany. <laughs> we, we yeah, about twenty straight nights. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I, I've had a few of those uh, uh, shoots in the in the hotel room with Mr. Briscoe too, and I'm glad he just uh, bit my. I think he bit my calf. To get me off. But that was about. <laughs> I, mean, I had I had because I was uh, probably inebriated this time, but I think I tapped you and Bruce out at out on the same bed. Rumor in you window, but I'll verify it. Good to you. And, and Angle, Kurt Angle was on the on the uh, balcony because you guys kept trying to back me up into Kurt. And he he came out of the door and then grabbed me with the waist lock, and I thought, oh Christ, here we go. But yeah. Those days don't don't exist anymore. Everybody's too busy playing video games. The worst yeah, thing ever was the worst thing ever, Todd, was when your brother Bruce got the amateur headgear, and he, <laughs> he he thought somehow that would give him talent to take down Jerry Briscoe. <laughs> well, he was just trying to feed him more more beer and more whatever he had just to see if he could. I, I think unless I think unless uh, Jerry's completely uh, unconscious, there, there's there's no chance. If he's got both eyes shut and you hear snoring for about ten minutes, I, I, I would venture uh, that we could go in and pin him, maybe with a one or one and a half, two and a half. He had his knee replaced recently, and I was trying to get down there in time for before he healed, but he already healed up before I could get down there. Yeah, yeah. I thought well, that's that my bit, chance. After all these yeah. years, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to beat the living hell out of it. <laughs> yeah. Good. How'd that work out for you? Well, yeah. it didn't because he healed, <laughs> and he probably right. would have beat me anyway. Right, right. Isn't that right, Jerry? Uh -huh. That's right. You no show me again. <laughs> <laughs> well... All I'm saying, yeah, I just said. Well, you're the shooting champion of Portland, Oregon. And that's another great place that had just outstanding talent. It had talent that could go a little bit. So you, you, the places you, you, you started your early career, you were really under great learning trees in, in all three territories. I, I really was. Uh, I just wish I would have took more advantage of it and I would have understood that um, uh, it's show business. And it's also business, business. And it goes back to uh, the booker a long time ago saying, somebody has to like, and you've got to offer something. you got to have something to offer. Um, what's, what's so special about some of the, some of the guys that can go out there and, and do some great moves, but what's missing? What's that, that personality, that connection? And when you had guys like Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart or Razor Ramon or Diesel or, or a Bradshaw who was – man, it, it, everybody had to understand when you saw Bradshaw, especially when he was, uh, I thought, wearing the uh, Army helmet on, and then the <laughs> cowboy hat on top, you know, that was, <laughs> that was Bradshaw. That was John Bradshaw. And, and uh, that, that's authentic. And you got to have something people can latch on to, connect to, want to watch you. Why do they want to see you? What's – what's so special and i didn't it's it is a game well we can all say it's not but it is a game and you got to know how to play the game uh so i did have some great teachers i had some great people to learn under i saw some things that went down and i went man i i, I think you can do it your way when it's your company but you have to do it their way when it's their company so I understood that, but it was still, if I didn't like somebody back then, I was, wasn't very good at hiding it. If I didn't want to be around somebody, I wasn't very good at hiding. It. And I didn't want to be, especially when, especially later on in my career, uh, WWE was, was 
a business and I was looking at it like it was still wrestling and it wasn't and it's not, but it, it intertwines that stuff. And uh, anywhere you go, it's still intertwined. You have to connect. And if you're not drawing money, what's, what's the point in being in the business, especially people uh, who, who are putting the money up, the promoters, the guys who are paying the bills, renting the buildings, doing all this stuff. They have every right in the world to tell you what they want. And if you can't do that, well, move next. So I didn't learn that till a lot, lot, lot later. And I got on the other side of the desk and, and started going. I went to, uh, you know, I was looking at Wish the other day and uh, I saw the Wish version of Michael Hayes, Joe, Joe, the, uh, what's, what's his name? Joe Exotic. <laughs> yeah, Joe Exotic. I thought that is Michael. Then I realized, no, I, I ordered from the wrong catalog. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, in, that's michael hayes son who had a little problem with meth yeah <laughs> <Joe Zotic. laughs> Tiger King. okay that was you then that uh, wasn't me yeah. i didn't say that yeah but uh, which, which, michael, by the way gerald briscoe used to live right next to the tiger king and now he lives right next to carol baskin don't tell me <laughs> there's something going on there hey, wait a minute i did live next door to joe exotic i live close i grew up closer where his his uh, his zoo was and uh, carol baskin does just right down the street here you can hear the tiger roar at night time you're you can hear the tigers and the rizats at her zoo. Hey, Jerry, you, you've lived close to a zoo pretty much your whole life. <laughs> Why'd you freeze? You froze up Tom again. We froze up Tom again. <laughs> it's that dang internet in Knoxville. That's what it is, Jerry. Um, hey, when I was talking, huh? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I was gonna... <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Michael Hayes uh wanted to remind me when i was talking on one of these podcasts before about mid-south and i said the rock and roll express midnight express uh jim Cornette, uh and and a lot of those guys that came with dundee and changed that big man territory into a totally different move a totally different territory and um michael called me up or texted me actually and said hey I don't think they were the only ones who revolutionized, revolutionized that territory. What about the free birds? I said, you're right, Michael. At 20 years old, you headlined the, the Superdome against the dog and almost blind him. Great angles. And the birds have always been great. But those guys don't exist anymore. Those kind of people don't exist anymore. That like, was what you got. <laughs> I, I, yeah. love, I love that Michael Hayes texts you over that. Over a podcast. Yeah, it, did. it was great. Because we go back and forth and just, just mess with, with, with each other. But uh, you know, they were authentic, man. You can't find it. Give me a Terry Gordy. Give me a Buddy Roberts. Give me oh. a Michael Hayes. There's, they're not out there. And you know, man, being around Dallas and that part of the country, um, the Von Erics and the Freebirds, they they were, again, it's like Dory and Jack. They meshed well. They had synchronicity. They had all the, all the stuff that, that, that made them authentic and people wanted to come and watch them. Yeah, but again, they all started at 14 seconds. years old. You said a word, there's synchronicity. Yeah, synchronicity. How is that? It means when everything's working just right and playing and writing all the same parts where you want to be, <laughs> That Oklahoma <laughs> education. Yeah, they yeah. Work yeah if it does. Mayor Kane, you hanging around Mayor Kane to increase your vocabulary, I see. Well, yes, actually, and I increased his. <laughs> he, I, I bet said you a few did. Words, I said a few words. He wasn't quite sure what it meant. <laughs> and I had to show him and I had to tell him. But it's okay. It works out even. So, hey, you uh, mentioned Dallas. Uh, you you uh, had an influence the same as I did. Uh, Skandor Agbar. Uh, when you started, what a man! Ag, Ag, Ag took me under his wing. I was part of Demolition Inc. It was awesome. Well, let me tell you a story about that too. One of my uh, first, actually, second times working TV, I went to Oklahoma, and it was uh, Brian Blair and Jimmy uh, Garvin in the dressing room. And I'm again, this is maybe my third match, fourth match, whatever, and. Herb Calvert. Do you remember Herb Calvert by any chance? Calvert, Oklahoma University. Yes, anyway. I remember yes sir. Calvert. And he, 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 he caught a... He was tragically killed and in a, in a, he was a highway patrolman. Wow. Yeah. Well, he, he was he was a pretty cool guy when I rode with him. He rode with me to the town. And uh, we're sitting there and tied the boots. And Jimmy says to Brian, he says, oh, man, is tonight that one boot battle royal? And we're Brian says, oh, hell yeah, I forgot all about it. Yeah. So then uh, they kind of let go, and uh, Jimmy comes over and says, or Brian came over and said, uh, hey, just want to let you know, 
we're doing this battle royal tonight, and Oki Shikina has been loading his boot. And uh, so everybody's going to wear their left boot only, take off their right boot, and come to the ring. Well, something didn't sound right, didn't feel right, but the referee came over before the, the, the main event and says, hey, if I were you, I would take off my boot or it's going to be really, really bad. I said, you got it. So I took off my boot and everybody had already hauled out to the, to the, battle, to the ring as I'm taking off my boot. And I walk out and Oki Shikina, Oki Shikina never wore boots. He wrestled barefoot anyway. And I got in the ring and uh, Akbar came to me and he says, come here, son. Are they messing with you? I said, yes, sir. Would you please get me out of here? He goes, come here. He threw me over the top rope. But everybody laughed. Everybody had a good time. I worked with Akbar in uh, Dallas a couple times, you know, when I was just starting out doing the shots here and there. And then, uh, but yeah, there were some guys like that, some some pretty upstanding veterans. And, and then you know, <laughs> the one boot said, battle royal. <laughs> one boot battle royal. Yeah. So, uh, hey, do you remember the time? Were you there when uh, I think you were there in WWE when uh, he's either uh, DOA, uh, one of the Harris boys were fighting the nation domination, and one of them went through Cornette's back windshield of his car? Yeah, I wasn't there, but I, I, I heard about it. Oh, my he goodness. Was, uh, I, saw, I was in Gorilla when Cornette. City. I was there. <laughs> huh? It was Atlantic City. Oh, okay. That's right, because yeah. uh, Jimmy Cornette had driven down from Stanford. And they had the backstage scene. And, and my understanding was they did not mean to go through the winch, his windshield of his car. What? Oh, did they, Jerry? <laughs> I, I didn't know. I would, I, didn't. Listen, listen. I, you know what? And again, this is just in you and in a rumor and innuendo. And I don't know for a fact, but what I do know for a fact is some of those office fellows, and I'm not talking about anybody from Oklahoma, but I could be. Some of those office fellas like to play, and I remember when they, they did it to Howard Finkel's car without telling Howard, you know, and banged it all up and all that other stuff, and I think they were looking for the same reaction from Jim Cornette. So, was Jerry, was it on purpose? Gorilla standing next to Jim Cornette when this happened, by the way. <laughs> and? Your did you get a ring Bruce, Your brother Bruce was the uh, uh, manic gorilla, and I was an agent at the time, and Cornette yeah. Cornette was getting ready to go on on the air. Right. We had this backstage scene, and I, and I forgot the participants. But anyway, they were going, and and I'd, I'd been out during the rehearsal, and then somebody Briscoe, which car is Cornette? So I said, I don't know. Well, so Damn. I went, and I found out which car. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, awesome. there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things we could clear up on this show. Oh, right that's here. great. Hey, Cornette is standing right here next to me. Hey, hey Jerry, 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 wait, Jerry, wait a second. You, you, now you got to understand, this, Tom. I think you know the story. This was taped earlier in the afternoon, yeah. so they they know that Cornette's car has been broken. The, one, of the, one of the guys threw one of the I think the Harris boys threw his back windshield and busted yeah. the car open, but they haven't told Cornette. So they nope. go up to Gorilla, and this is the first time Cornette seen it. So they kept it secret. Now we all knew about it, but Cornette didn't know about it. So go ahead, Jerry. Yep. So, so we're standing at a Gorilla. Cornette standing <laughs> right next to me. We're watching this thing, and Corny. I mean, it's it's damn good, you know. And Corny getting all into it and everything. All of a sudden, they he sees his car in the distance, about two rows back, and he elbows me, and he said, "No." And by, by the time he elbowed me and said, no, there goes one of the Harris boys through that back window. And he throws his, and the, the blue words <laughs> came out of his mouth. And he, I mean, he was scheduled to go on the next segment. He just threw all this stuff down, went out to the damn uh, parking lot, started up his car, and just left. Well, Jerry, he yeah. beat it up first, didn't he? He beat up his car. He beat up his own car with a bat. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because he, started, he, he, he got so bad. He did. He took care of the rest of the wedges, all except for the front <laughs> wedge. But I think even on the driver's side, there was a big spider web on the windshield on the driver. Yeah, yeah Tom, Tom, we were sitting there. Me and Barry Windham had heard it happen, you know, because, you know, we're all in the dresser and they told us about it. So we sneak up to watch Cornette's reaction at Gorilla. And he is so freaking mad. They want to mess with me. They want to mess with me. He gets to his car, pulls out a bat, and beats out his own windows. He goes, Vince McMahon yes. can buy my whole car. <laughs> yes, yes. I, that that doesn't surprise me in, in the slightest, you know. But um, uh, that was still the wrestling business a little bit back then. They still did stuff like that. 
So when, when they brought the report back, Cornette, somebody had gone out to the garage and saw Cornette leave. He left. I mean, he left the show. He didn't come. He didn't come back. They right. come back to Vince, 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 Vince. for the next segment. He just left. We had to change the next. And of course, Bruce running gorilla. I mean, he you know, he's okay. What do you guys? I mean, like he didn't know what was going on. You know. Oh come on, he didn't. He was an innocent, he was as innocent as an elfin orphan child on Christmas Eve. <laughs> that was his segment. That was his pre-tape, but that was his pre-tape. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so Vince asked so the guys coming back from the parking lot said, So what happened? They said, Vince, we think you just bought a car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, you know, I don't think he really minded. It just uh, I, you know the extent that, that some people go for or go to just to entertain themselves. So kind of like poking the bear sometimes. So, okay, Tom, Tom, you work for Cornet at, at, at Smoky Mountains, correct? Yeah. That, 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 that you know, that was a, Corny did a hell of a job up there in, in Smoky Mountain. I mean, he had that place jumping and popping and, and you and uh, you, you <laughs> Jimmy Del Rey, I believe Jimmy, little Jimmy. Jimmy was yep. all water worker. Uh, he was. Yeah. Well, well, uh, okay. He was working for Cornet back in the early days. Then, has well, he meddled once again, in old age? Uh -huh. Has he meddled out any in his old age? No, no, he really hasn't. And um, the the thing about Cornet, he's very passionate about everything he does, and he still wanted to to, to be professional wrestling. But it was in the early '90s. You know, times have been a changing for a long time, and uh knoxville tennessee and the surrounding areas have great wrestling crowds they're just not a whole bunch of them <laughs> you know they're nice wrestling fans but they're just wasn't a whole bunch of them and we go out we do this stuff and uh just wasn't a whole lot of people out there they had it looked like a good house because they were in high school gyms or you know the knoxville coliseum uh could get maybe 4,000 or 5,000 if we were lucky but it, it was just a different place different time and, you know, I, I respect Jim's appreciation and his intensity for everything he does. Uh, I, and I think what he means to say is if you have guys who understand how to do this, that professional wrestling correctly, it can work. The problem is there are no, there is nobody because the styles changed, the world's changed. And I think if you went out and if you had guys, and I might get heat for this too, but I'll say the FTR, they're an AEW. Man, they learn from the old school, but and they can do it. They know how to do it right. They're smooth, almost too smooth. But at the same time, they understand how to work the old school way by working a hold, doing the little nuances, just a, a move of the head or a move of the body language. They know how to do that, but not everybody does because all they want to see is flip, flop, and fly. No disrespect for the guys who can do that, but for Christ's sake, make it mean sense. Make it make sense and do it where you're not doing literally 12 super kicks in a row or 12 high-flying things in a row, and then the guy gets up and dusts himself off and don't, doesn't sell anything. That's what Jimmy still wants to see, and that's what Jimmy believes can still happen. But the problem is when you you don't know anything else. Wrestling, the name of wrestling holds was the announcer, the, the commentator, or the promoter talking about it. So there's a, a rear chin lock or a, a, a full Nelson, or, or call it something, the spinning toe hold, the, the famous funk spinning toe hold. And you know why? You know Dory grabs the right leg. You know why? Because it's a shoot. I asked Dory why. <laughs> and that was the answer. And then I worked with him in Amarillo in a tag match. Right. I worked with him in a tag match. He put the spin toe hole on it. I go, Christ, this is great. That, but but he's working my right leg and it's it's he's working. So it's the same <laughs> thing when you ask when you ask Dory a question, you know, about whatever it may be in that time frame. By God, I was hurt and I was laid up and I don't know. You know, and, and no doubt about that. But they also used to deal deal when Dory and Terry would get on a plane and and Dory would wear his toupee, and Terry would try to put his bag on, on top. You heard about that one, too, where he'd nudge Dory, and the toupee would fly around. Nobody knows how to do stuff like that anymore. And, um, <laughs> I mean, outside the ring, and be a gimmick outside the ring. Terry Funk bought a 
a tombstone with dusty roads running to florida you might have seen it if you were there dusty roads uh you know 19 something or 19 his career is going to end him going to bury his 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 career he walked through the airport with that thing you know he would do goofy stuff like that who could do that today and get away with it? nobody it, i mean i just don't see anybody else being able to do stuff that was done like that and that's what jimmy was trying to bring up jimmy was trying to keep it kayfabe and trying to keep everybody apart and trying to live it this way. All love, respect, and admiration for him in the world. Because uh, I would love to work there still. But it just was time was was moving on. And now here we are in 20, gonna be 2022. And uh, you know, how do you how do you make this exciting? How do you make this whole business go? I I don't know, but that's what Jimmy was looking for. I, I love Jimmy. I mean, I've, I've always, uh, in fact, I have a running joke with him because he told me before Smoky Mountain closed, he had a booking for me at Smoky Mountain. So every time I see him, I say, <laughs> hey, how about that booking? You go, and he always laughs. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. But, right. 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 Jimmy is, Jimmy's a brilliant guy. I mean, yeah. he's a fun guy, but what you see is what you get with, with Jim yeah. Cornette. I mean, he, he yeah. really is wild, crazy. And he really goes on rants like that. And it's, it's not a work. It's and that's no. the reason I love him. Yeah, that, that's that's what I love about him, too, because he's authentic and there aren't that many guys. Now the guys want to play a part and you can do that. But I, I think it's the same thing with the difference in, in movies and TV shows. Guys who guys who uh, w- when they go out and, and are that part, um, they're not playing. They immerse themselves in that character. Heath Ledger, when he was a Joker and all those guys who go on those uh on those shows and those those movies like that they you know you know larry hagman used to wear his cowboy hat through the airports because he he realized people wanted to see him as J.R. ewing he he wasn't a cowboy but that was his character and he knew it was important to the show to for him to do that you know who is a great heel right now and the best heel for the last 20 years is jake paul oh yeah 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 he's the best heel there is you know if you got people saying that guy's a really good heel. I love the way he does this heel stuff. That's not a good heel. You want to, right. you want people saying that guy's a complete asshole. Yes. I cannot wait to see him get beat. And if somebody yes. tells you, oh, he's just being a heel. No, no, no. He's really a dick. That guy's really a bad guy. I want to see him get beat. Talk to a boxing purist about Jake yeah. Paul. They hate him. Yeah. <laughs> hate yeah. him. He yeah. works hard. He does all this stuff on YouTube. And he never breaks character. And he believes he's the good guy. Yes, yes, yeah. Everything I about him. being a great heel is Jake Paul. Well, I and agree he's with gonna you. Make, and he's going to make tens of millions of dollars in boxing. Yeah, yeah. Who else is creating interest there? Is it, uh, it's, it's not the world champion. Um, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the world champion's name? Tyson Fury is the overall heavyweight champion. The, the boxer a, who's still a big draw but uh, yeah not, right not but that's boxer. what i'm saying people want to see this and i don't know if you saw was it uh woody who, who just dropped his hand and, and he took a knockout the other day and it just it was it was great i i, I said I, huh i was here in tampa yeah i mean but but it was it was you're right you know, only they know what's what's going on. We can assume what we want. When when it was was it Logan Paul who who messed with Mayweather too, and Mayweather was going to kill yeah. him. And man, and, and, oh oh man, it was great. It was it was tremendous because you think for a minute, but then I realized, you know, I was there when when uh, Mayweather broke Big Show's nose. And people can't believe the guy will get down and say, "Hey, you're actually going to take a shot for this." Well, that's what they used to do. That's how it got people convinced and in buying the fight. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it could. I wish it could be that way in wrestling still, but it's just. I think I don't know if it's too far gone, but there might have to be a generation, and then get back into it because once you've been doing the same stuff, as it shows, I think I don't watch that much these days because I'm I'm busy. But as it shows, not too many people are watching. You know, if Big Show could have would have caught Mayweather that day, he would have ate him. Yeah, <laughs> he was. He was. So, he was so mad. Big Show told him to hit him. You know, to Big Show, right. hit, he said, "Hit me," and Big Show didn't mind, but he was pretty hot about it. He, if he had caught him, that would have not ended well for Mayweather. 
but that's the authenticity of it. In the moment you are pissed, in the moment you that son of a bitch just broke my nose. And in the moment you are, you do want to kill him. But then you realize you're going to WrestleMania and, and doing what you're going to do. So uh, what better way to make it make it put some kind of doubt in people's minds? Because you can see his nose. It was crooked. And it was hurt. So, yeah, that, that needs to come back in some capacity. I just think I don't know if we're that far away from it or not. Yeah. No, I don't think we are. I think it's just a matter of somebody's got to be able to do it and stay in character the whole time. You know, I, I think people hurt themselves when they when they go on social media and they yes. talk about, you know, especially a heel when they go on social media and they'll say, oh, yeah, I really got over with that heel interview I did. I mean, people refer to themselves as heels and it's, it's just it's insane to me to do something like that. A heel needs to believe they're the good guy. And well, then, yes, be justified in what they do. Be justified in what they do and also never break character. You know, if you're at Disney and you wear your, your your outfit there, you can't break character. So why do it in the ring or do it outside the arena with people watching? Or Wrestling 2 kept his mask on for 20 minutes after we left the building. Buck Robley, Lord Jonathan Boyd, myself, and Wrestling 2. <laughs> Have you met Wrestling 2, John? I've never met him, I don't think, no. Well, he was one of those guys I locked up with him and uh, I went behind him just, just working. And, and he went behind, took me down. And he goes, that's, that's a good way to get yourself pinned, son. And I went, whoa, whoa. I was just playing. I was just, I was not, not that tough a guy, but two, two took his mask off and he used to smoke that pipe and Buck Robley was Buck Robley and John was John. And I'm just trying to fit in. And all of a sudden I'm in the back seat and Buck says, can, can you perform this task for me? And I won't mention what the task was, but I did my best. And he looked at it and went like, okay. And uh, anyway, but wrestling too wasn't what I expected outside the ring. But as long as he was in the arena, he kept his mask on, as ridiculous as that sounded even then. Then I started realizing, no, it's not ridiculous. It's this guy takes his business that serious in that time frame. And some people might have looked at it as a little uh, little out there. You know, it's just the boys in the dressing room, right? Well, Mel Moskris never took his mask off either. No. Well, Tom, but, but, you know the story about wrestling, too. He was invited. Jimmy Carter's mom was a, yes. huge, Lily was a huge fan of, of Mr. Wrestling, too, of course, Georgia. Um, and so Jimmy invited uh, uh, Wrestling, too, to his inauguration, uh, John. And the only way a two would go there if he was able to set up on that stage with his mask on. Really? Yeah. And then, and then uh, Secret uh, Service would not let him do it. They said, you got to take the mask off. And he refused the invitation because yeah. he wasn't going to go and be up there without his mask, be in public without his mask. At the inauguration of the President of the United States of America. Can you imagine that photo over there? Yeah. <laughs> but that that was the mentality i mean that was that was his life you know and he lived it i was yeah, driving that's... to nuevo laredo one time to work from monterey we we're working for uh, elizondo down cmll and we broke down on the side of the highway and a couple of boys picked us up and well the guy in the front right seat never said a word and I realized when they dropped us off, because we had the kayfabe, so they dropped us off, you know, about a block from the, the arena, that it was Mill Mascaris. Yeah. You know, and the reason he wasn't saying anything, because he felt very uncomfortable being there without his mask around an American, or around right. a person that he was not in his inner circle. I don't think it mattered that it was an American. It could have been a Mexican or J Japanese or anybody, but he didn't like that he, somebody outside of his circle would, saw him without a mask. Yeah, that, that, that was the mentality back then, and that was what was so cool about it back then, too, because uh, you did have that, that a little bit of uh, mystery and, and uh, stuff that was going on that you didn't know. Everybody didn't know everybody's business. There wasn't the social media. There wasn't everybody talking back and forth. So, uh, And I, I miss that a lot, too. Jesus Christ. But, but I understand. We can't go back. <laughs> And you know what? They're still they're going to fill up a, a huge crowd at WrestleMania. So, you know, yes. they're still, and, and the, the guys are getting paid more than ever before. I mean, it, yeah. it, it'd be good to be in the business right now. Right. But that's the reason John and I are here, Tom. We can go back through these stories. Aaron, and, uh, right. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's yeah. the reason we're 
re relive them because it was our our glory days, our days that you know we thought was the best ever in the business. And to us, they 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 were. And to these kids nowadays, this is the best time. I mean, I would love to be making the money that these kids are making now, but you know when we when we were coming up. The, the generation before us said the same thing. I'd love to be right. making the money you were making, kid. I mean, I, 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 you know, and you, you, you were along too at the same time. Where, where the, you, you know, the, that generation before my generation, they didn't make nothing. I mean, it was you know, it right. was a, it was life, and it was, it was hard to make a living and support. Well, them. I think I think too though it it could I could be mistaken on this, but I wanted to get into the business because I wanted to be a wrestler. I didn't. I want to be a movie star. You want to be a musician. I want to be a wrestler. There, Tom needs to make more money and buy himself some decent internet is what he needs to do. <laughs> <laughs> we got to call it, Tom. I'm glad he didn't hear that. <laughs> what? what? I said I you got to get nothing. <laughs> no, no, tell me, please. My internet froze up. <laughs> I said, you need to get the business now and make more money where you can buy some decent internet. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> but, oh, man, I don't want to rent on that either. But, uh, I mean, the, the road trips, the cars, the the, the afterwards, the, the going to the town, the coming back, the, the people you meet in between, um, the ones who really believed at one time, you know, it, it's like, okay, great. And then all of a sudden, they may not have believed that it was all up and up, but they enjoyed what you got, what, what, all of us were doing when when you go out there and you you at least kept it tight you at least kept it solid or in your case john kept it stiff we <laughs> you got to stop it hey wait a minute wait a minute you're talking about oh. road trips now you're talking about road trips now There's oh whoa, whoa, whoa wait hold on go ahead what no i, I was gonna There's say one I, thing I, about I, the mayor I, I could, the yeah. mayor of knox county will agree with me and yes. everybody that knows you will agree with me <laughs> you were in the board you were in the car with him you, you you are the worst driver in the history of the automobile. In, in the history, there's never been a worst driver ever. You that almost covers a lot of ground. <laughs> you almost a lot killed. Of ground. It must be a genetic thing with the Pritchard because his brother isn't too damn good either. Behind the wheel. <laughs> I, I rode a 300 mile trip with Tom driving one night. And we're going through fog. We're going through uh, every every element that uh, they can throw at you. Mother Nature can throw at you. It didn't affect Tom in, in the slightest. He sat there the same way, 75, 85 mile an hour with his head glued to the wheel. Fog, he didn't slow down. Rain, he didn't slow down. I mean, we, we but we Gary, made we're, it. You were up near Wilkesbury one time, and it's fog so bad, you can hardly see the front of the hood of the car. Okay, and just like, just like what you just said, Tom's driving 75, 80 miles an hour. And I'm sitting there on the passenger side, I'm and Dutch is in the back, and I'm thinking, I'm so glad Tom's driving because I can't see nothing. And Tom looks over at me because it doesn't matter because he can't see the road. So he might as well look at me. So he looks over at me. He goes, you know, I can't see a thing. And I said, why are you driving 80 miles an hour? And as he does, he's hit a ditch. Now, Tom will tell you that ditch was in the middle of the road. I will it was tell a you pothole. The was in the ditch. <laughs> yeah, it was a pothole. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you've already confessed that you couldn't see anything. And, and then all of a sudden, I went ahead and drove and took our lives in our hands, and it was a damn pothole. But the, well, the worst part about it is Dutch gets out, and I, I, well, I, I did I try and change the tire? I think I might have. Yeah. But then Dutch I, got I, out. I had the jack, the little toy jack. Yeah. yeah. But then, then, so you knew about this too, because Dutch said the, the, the wheels were, the, the, the lug, lug nuts, nuts were stripped. Yeah. Yes, they were stripped. And then I think uh, you tried one more time and, and looked at both of us and said, you idiots, you got to take the hubcap off. <laughs> and I thought, well, how, you know, how am I supposed to know that? I don't. Uh, <laughs> I've got the, the little jack, off. Gary. I've got it up. Yeah. And Dutch and Tom have said, lug nuts are stripped. And I go, oh, geez. Now we're on the side of the road. Nobody can see anything. And we're, I know we're going to get hit by a truck or something. And I've just got the little toy jack, finally get up. And I look at the wheel and I said, lug nuts are stripped, right? And they go, yeah, we're screwed. Four cell phones. And I said, you know, if you guys would take off the hubcap, you could get the lug nuts. <laughs> I think Dutch asked you not to tell anybody about that either. He did. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm driving now because Tom's been fired forever. 
<laughs> Dutch is in the passenger seat. Tom's in the back. Tom just said, to heck with you. He goes to sleep, and Dutch leans over. And he goes, you don't have to tell anybody about this, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. I'm telling well, everybody who has ears. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I thought, you know, if you remember going to the gym in San Antonio, that was where we got this big, uh, there was a there was a log jam up ahead. And you, got, and you guys you guys were something, saying something. And I had to join the conversation. But yet, I, I wasn't paying attention to in front of me either. And that was another time where uh, I slammed on the brakes. So I think, Glenn, both of you, oh, what the hell? Whoa, whoa, hey. I'm like, yeah, man, it'll be all right. You, you almost us killed us, Jerry. Well, it's okay. It's okay. It almost counts only in, in almost cars. Okay. Hey, how about the time you got so mad at me for no reason outside of Long Island, outside of the uh, Coliseum, when I accidentally hit you in a car? That's what I wanted to discuss. You said it was a, <laughs> it, was a it was a Mazda. It was it was a Honda Prelude. <laughs> I know. I know. I know you don't. I know that's the point. That's why I was, I was trying to engage in conversation one time. And they said, "Oh, well, he must be hot." No, no, I know my driving <laughs> might be just a little under par, but no, because it's my damn car, and we're going so you guys kept bumping me. I said, "Oh man." Come on, stop. So you just, and I knew because I've done the same thing. I've done run into people, demolition derby and shit like that too. So, but, but it was a, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what off. happened, Jerry, was Tom, we see Tom in front of us, just me and Godfather and I think Ron, and we're Ron bumping him going good. down the road, you know, as you do, you know, 34 miles an hour, bumping him going down the road. And all of a sudden, Tom just locks the brakes down and gets out in the middle of this three lane street. And you can tell he wants to fight. And I thought, well, what's he so mad at? And he's cussing at me like you wouldn't believe. And I'm going, if I get out of here, he's going to hit me. And I don't know why he's mad at me. I, I don't want to fight Tom. He's my friend. It wasn't It wasn't my rental car. It was my car. And <laughs> yeah. Dennis, Dennis and, uh, and uh, Godwin, uh, Dennis and Mark, both came out. And, and Mark kicked my car first. I said, hey. So Dennis said, oh, is that your car? And he kicked it too. And I went, God, why? Why? <laughs> you know, so. But that was I, said, fun I finally rolled down the window and I said, Tom, <laughs> why are you so mad? It's a rental car. And Tom goes, that's my personal car, you asshole. I would <laughs> and say and Godfather, Godfather's over on the side. He goes, why would anybody buy a prelude? <laughs> and Tom, now Tom's really mad. <laughs> Screw you. Yeah. I like preludes. <laughs> I was well, a good car. It was Cornette's problem when you got when we beat up uh, tore up Cornette it was his personal car. I wasn't a rental car. <laughs> well, that's right. That, that, that's what it was. But I didn't have Vincer going. Oh, go ahead, guys. I'll pay for that one. So <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't in the. I wasn't in that uh, moment or that click. That's that circle sure. at that time. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that circle. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And then when Tom Tom's in the middle of the street, there's people, cars going by everywhere. He wants to find whoever's getting out of our car. I was like, well, Tom, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was your car. You should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I figured. <laughs> but, you know, that's that. We, we can't have fun like that anymore, Jerry. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, you have outlaws trying to run Tom, you off the road. You, you, you've traveled the world now. Now, now you're up in Knox County, uh, uh, Virginia or Tennessee. What is that? Knox no Knoxville, County. Tennessee. Yeah, Knoxville. right outside of Tennessee. Knoxville. And, and you uh, and the mayor there have have a, a wrestling school where you're you're trying to to teach the the, the end. How difficult is it now to kind of get what you what you know in your mind is right and what these kids are seeing on 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 every before social media to try to try well, blend in the, the two to make it acceptable. I, I learned this through the years, even teaching uh, with WWE, wherever I went, there's there's your way, there's my way, but the right way and the only way does we lose him on the right way. It's that internet again. We got to do that. He's out there in Hillbilly Land, Tennessee. <laughs> How about Oklahoma? Big, What's that? You froze up for a second. I know I did. That's my internet. Thank you very much. Knox County is not doing a very good job. But we uh, actually, tell, we won't tell of, the mayor. I was going to say that's the city of Knoxville, not the county. But but anyway, you know, um, I, I think once they understand, and here's what we do show: uh, there's not a whole lot of Jack and Dory matches out there in full uh, a full match. They're cut up in places and spots. And I show these guys 
how they do the moves and how they sell. And I explained, you can't sit there for two minutes or three minutes anymore. You can't. But while you're there, body language and, and doing the basic stuff. If you watch any match today, doesn't matter what company, you're going to see a lockup. You're going to see the guy circle in the ring. You're going to see somebody grab a headlock. You're going to see somebody do the basics and fundamentals. I don't know how many O'Connor Rolls I counted the other day or a small package or a backslide. Simple, basic moves that you can build on once you get your foundation. And I explained that. Um, that I, I was never a good high flyer. I was never, I was, did what I did, but I knew I was that guy who, who could do the basics, understood where to go next. Uh, it didn't always work out the way I wanted it to, but the point is when anybody comes in, I explain to them, we're going to go over the basics first and they never go out of style. Even with all the, hot, the, the, the stuff, it's still blocking and tackling. It's still hitting the ball over the fence. It's still trying to make a home run. Same thing with this. Uh, Glenn was the one who asked him, what do you think about doing a school? And I, I'd been around Knoxville. I'd been around Tennessee. They have a lot of independent guys who don't want to change their style, who just want to play wrestling. It's not a problem. But we do have some guys who come through who actually want to do this, actually want to make – a career out of this or a business out of it there's a short time span there are no 40-year careers anymore you know it's it's if you get in if you have a 10-year career 10-year spot you're lucky so we explain that learn this get to this get this down first and then we'll add on to it you can try your moon salt and have a coronas and topes toupees and all that stuff so uh that that's what we we tell them and glenn does stop by and he talks about what it is to do big guy stuff but at the same time, even though you're a big guy, you still have to know how to bump because you're going to come across somebody one day that you're going to have to bump for. Nobody gets away from it. And even if you don't, at least you know how to do it. And, and we tell everybody that because you will get lost in a match. If you know how to just grab a hold or, or uh, come right back around to the same body part, or even if you're completely lost, if you know how to grab any kind of hold from an arm bar, a hammer lock, a head lock, a, a top wrist lock, and you hold it there, and then you get your brains back <laughs> and you start thinking again, uh, that's what we go over. We go over a lot of the basics and fundamentals. And we've been very, very fortunate, man. We've had uh, one girl, Emily Ann Zula, sign uh, WWE. We've had some people sign with AEW. We've had some people out here on the independents who are doing what they want to do and living their dream. So I... I do have a, a curriculum. I do have a method to the madness. And I explain, respect is given, earned, and then got. So you can't just walk in there thinking you know everything because you don't know anything. And, uh, but, but if you study and become a student of the game, uh, we always tell you, I, you could do whatever you believe in. If you believe it and you have the confidence, um, you can do it. That's the truth. I've seen it. I didn't have the confidence I wish I had when I was growing up in the business. Um, but that there's no excuse. That's just the facts. I see people who lack confidence and then gain it. And that's great to see. So as a coach, it's not always about what you do on the playing field. I think to get across to them and Jerry, you know, this as an agent, I tried being an agent. Uh, that was terrible. Not a good job. Not for me anyway. But as an agent, you have to get somebody's confidence and you have to know how to direct them and steer them that way. So I can do that with somebody who knows nothing and I can get you in 12 weeks to at least where you can have a decent passable match and you work on it and go forward and work on the rest of the elements you need to work on, whether it's your body, body language, just the small things and watch it come together. That's the gratifying part about what we're doing now. You know, Tom, I was fortunate to be able to train under Brad Reingans. And Brad was yeah. probably in the in the 80s and 90s, maybe 2000s, probably the best trainer around. And he trained so many top names, Brock Lesnar, Vader. I mean, so many different guys. That all, Most of the guys that came out of Minnesota. You've been the modern day, and that, this is a huge compliment for the world, the way I intended, the modern day Brad Reingans. I mean, you, you've trained a lot of incredible stars. List some of the stars that you've trained because I looked it up and I, it's hard, it's a hard record to believe, but so I, and I don't want to say a name that didn't belong. So you list the name of some of the stars that you've trained. Well, I, obviously rock had been working in Memphis. He went to go get some, uh, 
something under his uh, under his feet first. But when he was getting ready to make it to WWE, um, he came and trained with with me, getting ready for SummerSlam. Uh, Mark Henry was training at the same time, and uh, there, there's a lot of guys that, that had been working before they got to me. So I can't, I really can't take credit for everybody's start to finish, uh, except for the ones who who did come in developmental and then made it. Uh, guys like Roman Reigns, the Usos, who they grew up in a wrestling family, man. How could they not have that pedigree to be great? So, you know, uh, a lot of the guys that, that have come through the last, God, 20 years, because we started development in 93, but the last 20 years, um, I've either had a, a chance to. He needs to train himself some internet. <laughs> Tom, why go? Why go? <laughs> you know, right now, he's, right now he's listing. Why go? Why go? Now you're back, Tom. <laughs> oh, shit. So all that was gone too, right? Or could you guys he hear me? He left off with the Usos. Damn it. Well, I can say the Usos and, and a lot of these guys who already were in the family and, and understood wrestling, they grew up with it. But I met somebody uh, a couple weeks ago um, who told me, they said, man, I just want to thank you because you got me hired WWE. I didn't know that. But, the, but apparently, when he came for the tryout, we gave him the thumbs up. And uh, he got in, and then two weeks later, I was fired. So the guy walked in on a match that uh, I was having with, uh, oh, man, uh, Chronic. Not Chronic. The, the guy from uh, the – the tag team. I had. I was having a one-hour Broadway because I would do the one-hour Broadway with guys sometimes in, in Tampa. And he said that was his first day of class. Two weeks later, they fired me. But he, he said we gave him a thumbs up, and he always wanted to come and thank me for it. So there's a lot of guys who say I've done Elias. I, honest to God, he came for a tryout. I didn't remember it, but he told me about it. Uh, Baron Corbin, same thing. I didn't remember it, but he told me about it. So. You know, when guys tell me that, and they, t they said I had an influence or helped them out, um, I don't know who I have and who I haven't. Some <laughs> some guys get mad because I yell and scream too, man. I yell and scream, and I just but I tell them it's for the effect. This is my this is what I do. It's not don't take it personal because once I close the door, it's over. Next day we start over. But some people need a pat on the back. Some people need a kick in the ass. And there's that much distance. You got to figure out what works. How do you how do you communicate with these guys? And uh, I've tried to look at guys like a Briscoe who's been through amateur wrestling and then gets into pro ranks. And I've seen, I know how he produced our matches. Boy, when we were the Bonnie Donnas, we were, we were like on the top of the list. Yeah. But I get that. I understand that. I totally understand where the pecking order is. I understand what you have to do to get someone to like you. And uh, a lot of guys would come in with this attitude, and it has to be the right attitude. You, you've got to be willing to learn. You've got to be willing to listen. You've got to be willing to put in the work. A lot of people say they want to, but they don't. And it's it's been, God, I don't know how many people through the years, but it's always cool to meet somebody who remembers that I what I did back then, and it wasn't so bad. So, and Did you have uh, Brockus at one time? Boy, did I. Brockus, it was Brockus, uh, Mark Henry, and Rock who were training at the same time. And I went on the road uh, with Brockus as Dr. X under the hood. And oh, that's right. I yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the only matches that were uh, really good for Brock. I, I, Brockus seemed like a nice guy, but he just didn't. Uh, nice guy. Know. But no, it just, you, you, have to, you have to have some kind of passion for this. I mean, he was a big, stocky guy. But the first night I worked with him, uh, he gave me a clothesline, like within the first two minutes of the match. Why? I don't know. He just got scared and didn't know what else to do. Knocked me, not out, but just knocked me loopy, concussion. I was going head just banging. Had two more nights to go with him, and uh, he had a hard enough time remembering the simple stuff in the match. So not only would we call it in the back, I was calling it in the ring for him, too, and then yeah, I was around Brock. He's a great guy. I, I loved him to death. We had a fun time. And, uh, you know, I, I screwed that up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, Tom, don't to, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to mention anything about him either because he, he might be listening too. Listen about Brock. who? Bro Brock is. 
Brockus. I love Brockus. We had a fun time when we were living in Stanford. If you can imagine that, you've been to Stanford. I have been. Yes, and and I live downtown, and Brockus lived just a couple streets over. But if you can find a fun time in Stanford, there might be some nefarious things going on. I'm not going to mention that one. <laughs> you think? I know. Stanford, uh, that's where you first came into contact with the Olympic gold medalist, right? And you you took him off of green uh, green green grass and uh, and 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 taught him out of the money side of the business. But but the but. Kurt, uh, man, you know this. Kurt was sharp right off the bat. Kurt was a, was a sharp guy. And he knew when I locked up with Kurt the first time, I told him, I actually said, Kurt, I have nothing to prove to you. I don't want to beat you. I couldn't beat you. I ain't going to play with you. So please don't do it to me. I made sure because I don't want to get stretched by gold medals with a broken freaking neck. But yeah, no, he was, and Kurt was a lot of fun too. You know, he really was. He got it pretty, he, he cut on pretty quick. I've never seen anybody catch on quicker than Kurt because he yeah. was learning on, on national television. I mean, he didn't really have, you know, a system to go through and, you know, have a bunch of matches before he got WWE. And he came in when we had an, one of the best rosters WWE's ever had. Yeah. And he, he rose to the top in that scenario. That was pretty incredible. What Kurt I, I, I think so, but I think a lot had to do with Kurt's confidence in, confidence in himself. He was sure he, he knew – the real stuff. And as he went on, he kept getting better and better. And as he knew the boys and learned the boys, he said, yeah, this is, this is a pretty cool place. He had some, uh, uh, you, just it, some, you just mentioned uh, Kurt having the confidence, you know, we had, we had Kurt doing so much hokey stuff. And one, yeah. one day, I mean, some, so some of it was so hokey, I would get pissed off and, and I, I couldn't understand why Kurt, I, and I thought, I, Kurt, come here, I need to talk to you. Yeah, and it's yeah. mostly for my my peace of mind. I said, you know, I Kurt, you got to help me out here because a lot of this stuff, I speak up and say, no, let's don't do that to Olympic gold medalist. And then Kurt, yeah. I said, well, why? And then they go to you. Well, I got no problem with it. And he said exactly what you said. He said, Briscoe, he said, I have so much confidence in myself that I can do it the right way and make it fit my my image that I'll do anything they want me to do. And the thing, Jerry, Jerry, he was good at it. I mean, you know, it's hard to do some of that hokey stuff and do it right. As crazy yeah. as that sounds, you know, Gary Hart, you mentioned, I love Gary. Uh, you know, yeah. he helped me a lot. Gary always said if they, if they want you to be a clown, be the best clown they've ever had. Right. You know, and that's hard to do. Kurt, Kurt was so talented that he could do that hokey stuff and then switch right into the, the, this Olympic gold medalist back to back. It was most guys couldn't do something like that. I say most. 99.9% .9 of guys couldn't have done that. Well, most guys aren't gold medalists either. And don't, <laughs> haven't gone through that training and that, that, uh, that extra mental part of this. Because, man, it, it, whether it's amateur or professional, whether it's business or, or whatever it may be, it's mental. I mean, it really is a mental part of it. And Because I've seen guys who, in my opinion, couldn't work a lick, look like hell but they kept these spots because they knew how to get over not only with the fans, but they knew how to get over in the back with the boys. And if he didn't feel right, he knew how to make it right. And that was Kurt, man. I mean, he really was. He was confident uh, from day one. Kurt asked me one time, there were a couple of guys just horse playing in the ring, you know, on house shows and stuff. And, and Kurt didn't really like it. And so he came to me one time, pulled me aside and he said, Hey, what, what do I need to do? And he was wondering if there was like a pro wrestling trick, you know, to do something, you know, to get back. And I, I said, you're a gold medalist. Yeah. And he just looked at me and goes, okay. And it, just, it didn't occur to him, you know, he was thinking, right. is there something I should do in pro wrestling to kind of get these guys good horse playing? I said, Kurt, you take those guys down one time. And I said, I promise yeah. you, they'll never do it again. And Kurt didn't hurt them, but just one time took them down real quick and that stopped the horse play. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to let him know I, I, I knew he was capable of it, and I wasn't, so let's not even go there. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. He's just a different level. You know, guys like him and Shamrock, you know, it's just you're in the ring of those guys, and you realize these guys are these guys are a different level. I mean, just a but, different level. And, and I think knowing them outside and away from the ring and just, just, just at the building, chilling out or watching their, their routine, watching what they do, um, 
it, it, it is a unique character. It is a unique animal. And that's why you only have certain people who can rise to that occasion and, and get beyond uh, where they are and, and advance further. And Kurt and Shamrock and those guys, they were legitimate. They were the real deal. They understood how to work, but they, they also understood they were authentic. And if you want to play, we'll play. But if you want to go, let's go. They had no qualms about that. And I that's think right. That, no, they didn't care. They didn't care getting beat. Yeah. They didn't care. They knew it was a work. You know, they knew if it wasn't right. a work, that you, you i wouldn't be <laughs> yeah. in the ring with them no, <laughs> exactly but most most of those real shooters that didn't it didn't bother them doing jobs didn't bother them they, they understood this was a work and that's how kurt yeah. and uh, ken were thankfully for all of thankfully. us <laughs> yes yes I, I i had a few dinners with ken outside the ring and we had dessert as well so <laughs> you know what i mean and, and i looked at this guy like dude he's one of those uh I don't want to use a comparison, but I almost have to. Manny Fernandez type guys who who was crazy, but knew when to draw it in at times. I don't know if Manny knew how to draw it in, draw it in because Manny was just having fun. But but Ken, Manny forgot yeah. that last. He skipped class that day. Yeah, yeah Manny, Manny was not there that day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was man again. Manny and Chavo were my two real first mentors that uh, and i went oh god oh geez and we uh well, yeah no quick story about many many from nanda's we're coming back from uh, lake wells or one of those little towns down on highway 60 where at three o'clock in the morning there's zero uh cars on on the highway we've all been on them so i'm driving i i, I got a rent a car for some reason a little toyota corolla and right in the middle of the emergency brake and i'm going around about 60 70 mile an hour all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Manny just looks at me and starts laughing. And he reaches down and he pulls that emergency brake off. Yes. And we go into a skid, and I'm thinking, boy, at any time, we're going to start flipping, flipping. And he lets go of the damn thing. We gain control. And he just sits there and starts laughing. I'm cussing him out in <laughs> many words that I know my mom would be so mad at me. Yeah, she heard that language coming out of her baby son. And man, hey, buddy, that, that was Manny Fernandez. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. 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 And, and again, you know, you had legitimate crazy guys back then. Now I don't know how many guys are legitimately crazy just trying to pretend. So. <laughs> well, there were some back then. I, I, my first night in the business, I went out till five o'clock in the morning with Manny Fernandez and Butch Reed. Oh, <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've had dinner and dessert too. Butch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So, exactly. But, yeah, it, 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 you don't have any Wahoos anymore either, or any Wahoo McDaniels. But the guy just uh, – I watched a match with, with him uh, against Manny a couple weeks ago for, for a podcast. Wahoo was 50 years old and was still taking those shots and throwing the chops and stuff like that. I know we can't do that today. This is back from Super Clash when Vern tried to run his uh, promotion. But – but yeah, all those guys, that was what made it so great, man, because you had guys like, uh, quick story, I know we're running down, Keith Franks, Adrian Adonis. You, you ever met him, John? No, Adrian. I don't think I've ever met Adrian. Okay, his name was Keith Franks, and I heard about him just being on the West Coast. We were at, we were in St. Louis, and it was Tiger Conway Jr., uh, Chavo, and uh, Keith Franks. We're going out to the car. And uh, Chavo opened the, the trunk and we put our bags in and Keith lights up a unfiltered cigarette. <laughs> this is, and that's sort of God, if I wouldn't have seen this and you told me this, I would call you a liar to this day. But I saw it. Two cops walked up to Keith. And he goes, uh, the one cop says, hey, you can't do that. Keith goes, I ain't got nothing. And it was like that hypnotized, uh, you know, mind, whatever it is. They said, okay, and walked away. And I went, he just lit up a joint in front of two cops. And he says, I ain't got nothing. And they walked away. Those are legitimate crazy guys. I met Dr. Jerry Graham my first night in LA. I, I mean, here's Dr. Jerry Graham who got his mother out of the hospital. She died, put, him over, put her over his shoulder. Cops came, beat him about the head and face. And a big newspaper article, just all these crazy things known about him. But yet he's in this society, he's in this brotherhood of professional wrestlers. And uh, that was what I wanted to be a part of. I love the crazy guys, man. The Jim Morrisons, the, the David Lee Ross, the guys who who would talk like they're nuts, look like they're nuts, but you knew. 
they were doing it for the effect. They were doing it because it's sound bites. They do it because that's what got them attention and got them on the cover of the magazines. And and all these guys back then, especially one of my other mentors when I was growing up was Mark Lewin, Jerry. Mark Lewin in Houston. Go to the gym with him. You know what Mark used to do before he go to the gym, I'm sure. And when we come back from the gym, and when we go to the town. Huh? I've been with him. Yes. Yes, me too. And I was a kid back then. I was picking him up at his apartment on telephone. Huh? I was too. Yeah, okay. There you go. There you go. Then you know. I, 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 sorry, but I, I was in Australia my first year, my first year in a business with Mark Lund, uh King Curtis, Curtis. And, Mr. Fuji, and Mr. Fuji, and crazy uh, Luke Graham. Yes. That was, that was my indoctrination to a foreign tour. I'm not going to go into any stories, or we're going to have Don Morocco on pretty soon, and yeah. uh, Morocco can tell. <laughs> right, right. I had lived it, and I got to live it. I'm going, oh my god, this is just great. I don't want to live a regular life. I don't want to be a normal, whatever normal is. But but these guys weren't, and these guys, you know, even if it was a work, it was so cool to watch it work. Hey Tom, you, know, you talking about you know, don't know if it's a work or not? I, one time, Dick Murdoch, I, I go to pick him up, you know, to go to the show. We're going up to like Fort La, Fort Sill or somewhere Oklahoma, and I pick him up, and he's hung over. And no, normally he doesn't sell nothing. He doesn't, you know, right. but this is the work. I've never seen him look so bad. And so he goes, "You're driving, kid." He never let me drive. He would drink the entire way, and he'd never let me drive. But he was so sick, he told me to drive. So I'm driving and he he just looks terrible. You know, it's not like he had a, not like he looked great anyway. You know, he was so pale and, you know, didn't work out, you know, but he's tough as he could be. Great guy. Love Dick. So we're driving up there and I said, Dick, you mean to pull over? And he goes, no, kid, keep driving. So I'm a little bit later. I said, Dick, are you sure you don't want me to pull over? And he goes, keep driving. So we get up to finally the Red River. I said, Dick, are you sure you don't want me to pull over? And he said, keep driving. As soon as we got across the Red River, he goes, pull over, kid. He got out and he threw up all over Oklahoma. Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. And when he got back yeah. in the truck, he told me, he goes, don't ever throw up in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those kind of guys. Those are the kind of guys I wanted to be around and wonder where they're from. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he lived, he lived for that OU Texas game just to try to find JR Bill Watts and yeah. where he wore his Texas jersey. <laughs> and he never played it down for West Texas. Never. I mean, he played. Yeah, yeah. Never. Uh, he never. He played. He played in the alumni games. Yes. And he yes. never even went a day to college. Right. Right. They, they let him hang around. Uh, Stan was on, and we asked Stan about him, and Stan told it the story, right, John? You know. Yeah. We, we, everybody liked him, and he was just there every day, so we let him play. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, he uh, played who, who in the alumni called? games and didn't go to college one day. <laughs> right, right. I mean, how can you beat that? You can't. <laughs> you can't. No. Well, Dr. Tom, thank you so much for coming on, man. I was so excited when uh, Jerry said we're going to have you on. You and I rode together. I, for people that don't know, for a couple, me, you, and Dutch, me, you, and yes. Kane, we rode together for or quite some time in WWE. And man, it's some of the best memories I, I, of my life. Well, me too, man. I tell you, I, I know a lot of people would say, you know, I was a weird guy and I, you got to get to know me. I wouldn't let you get to know me very well or so. Hey, dude, it was all just a part of not, I didn't, I was so afraid of getting fired for saying all the wrong things because I used to say all the wrong things <laughs> and do all the wrong things. But, you know, yeah, it, I, riding with you and Dutch, it was, again, it was Dutch had stories, you had stories. We weren't combing our hair the whole time. And we weren't we weren't just talking about wrestling. There were other things in the world that could go on. And Dutch is a great storyteller. You're a great storyteller. I rode one time with uh, Jerry Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, and Tommy Rich. And I think uh, Nick Patrick might have been in there too. And, and Jerry won't remember this, but but he was again one of those guys that I looked at and I said, Yeah, this is why I want to be in this stuff, man, because these were the guys I wanted to emulate. These were the guys who who just live life like like an outlaw, like you know, the earth was last night's bed. Sure it was. You know, we could sleep where we wanted with whoever we wanted, most of the time, drink and do whatever we wanted most of the time in fact i know a lot of people who did it all of the time and it was a great great time and i really and i enjoy i appreciate you guys having me on this show to finally clear up some discrepancies that i was a prelude not a mazda i'm not the worst driver in the world or, 
that 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 might be dependent who you talk to but uh yeah i enjoy you guys stories too i've seen it a couple times on the internet and, and watching it even when the internet was working so <laughs> thank you guys for having me on man i do appreciate where, it where you could get the internet anyway in there knoxville yeah. right yeah <laughs> well we're working on that i'm gonna talk to glenn about that pretty soon i hope so, well, thank you guys i really do appreciate man, it man. i'll stand up for you you're not the worst driver in the pritchard family i'll tell you that well, <laughs> there you go and i, I want to go on record to saying we got the best pritchard on the show today oh and he froze up again <laughs> how great is that we're putting him over right. and he froze he's up he's got great timing that's a great a great thing about dr tommy he's got great timing so he froze up <laughs> he has a great time he may have hung up on us, Jerry. He probably did. <laughs> I was trying to defend him, too. I was saying he's not the worst driver in the Pritchard family. His, his brother, his little brother is. Yeah, his brother is, is a terrible. See, have you, ever, have you ever talked to Tom when he takes his glasses off? He, he, if he can't hear you, you know, he's in trouble. Tom's looking, looking all over the place for you. Look, he, 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 <laughs> I missed all that. He, as soon as he said, I want to go on record as... <laughs> I was really like, I said, oh man i yeah. go on record as saying we have the best preacher on the show today and well, it's not even it. close <laughs> oh well he'll, he might just tweet that with you but but bruce works his ass off guys you do know that right i you know what no in, in fairness out of, yep. out of eight eight billion people bruce has two friends me and jerry and that's it so, <laughs> that'd be, be one so we're his only friend so <laughs> he's got oh, nowhere to go yeah around. exactly that's we got i mean uh yeah we're, we're set with them now you know that's right yeah. we're stuck with him now we, we can't get rid of it and we love bruce yeah yeah no doubt well, well for the record too <laughs> No, I love Bruce. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna you were hoping it would freeze up. I was hoping it would freeze up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>